All right, everyone. So it is an honor to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank you again to the South Carolina Historical Society for having me here and for all of you for zooming in. So the title of my book, I think, says a lot about my mission in life and the mission of this book, Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine. I think for anyone who is a scholar of African-American history or know anything about it, they understand that a lot of this history has been forgotten over the years. It has not been part of mainstream history, and it is through work like this book and countless others of scholars going back generations that were able to tell a broader and better and more honest history of these people who were literally bound to the fire and working on these plantations throughout our nation's founding. So the purpose of this book is multifold. First of all, it's to give credit to these men, women, and children who worked in these plantation kitchens. I think that there's been a lot of mythology around these people's contributions, and we're trying to fix that collectively as we move forward through the work that we're doing in African American foodways. I also do what's called um, a term coined by Michael Twitty, which is uh, really establishing culinary justice, a way in which we give attributes contribution to these people's recipes and their actual contributions to American cuisine, also to bring attention to these historic kitchens that are literally still standing across our nation. We've got these amazing historical kitchens everywhere from Philadelphia, South Carolina, Georgia, Texas, and a lot of these kitchens need preservation and need people like yourselves to care about them and make sure that they don't get bulldozed or get lost in time. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, the work that I do, and particularly lectures like this, I want to tether the romance of food to the reality of slavery. And I can, I can absolutely bet that some of you are zooming in because you want to hear about the food. And I totally understand that. I was a chef for 10 years. I've been a historian now for 25. And I understand the want to know about these recipes. But it, we cannot forget about the people who actually cook them. And so, you know, the, the purpose of tonight's talk is to really kind of recalibrate the ways in which we think about food, the ways in which we think about American cuisine, and also the ways in which we honor these ancestors who labored in these kitchens. All right, so why cooks? People ask me this when I first started my research. Why cooks? Why are you focusing on cooks? Um, well, what I want to do is I want to push back, and I, I have been successful in many ways, I think, in pushing back against the myths of these enslaved cooks who worked in these kitchens. And if you can think about everyone from Uncle Ben to Aunt Jemima and all of these characters and caricatures, right, that have really made their way into popular culture, there's so much sort of mythology around these people who they were and how they were valued or devalued in history. I also want to focus on the reality of what their lives were like. You know, how did they persevere in slavery? How did they use their role as a chef to get things that they needed, right, for their family or for themselves? And how did they also resist enslavement, um, which was very much a part of every enslaved person's reality? And lastly, what is the legacy of these enslaved chefs? So I start with this image um, for multiple reasons, because this is one of the biggest sort of, um, you know, mythological images that people think about when they think about enslaved cooks. This wonderful mid 20th century painting is, um, is located at Berkeley Plantation in Virginia. And it depicts this very clean kitchen where the mistress of the house, the white lady of the house is in there with her, you know, very inauthentic outfit, cooking the food while these enslaved cook assistants, right, are sort of helping her make the food what it is. And this kind of mythology is really born out of late um, 19th and early 20th centuries, myths around enslaved cooks, myths around the ways in which they contributed to American culinary history, and sort of a rewriting of that pre-Civil War Americana. And this kind of image, I think, floods most people's minds when they think about these plantation kitchens, uh, because of the ways in which these spaces have been interpreted at these historic house museums. So I work at Stratford Hall, the birthplace 
of Robert E. Lee. Um, it is also the birthplace of several other Lee, Lee, very important Lee family members, as well as hundreds of enslaved African and African Americans. And so being able to really sort of recalibrate this history um, and push back against images like this to give everybody a voice is a very important part of my work. So what are some of these myths? Let's talk about that for a moment. So one of the first things that we see this sort of sort of mythical enslaved cook sort of showing up in American material culture and visual culture is the birth of what's called Black Americana. This came out of minstrel shows during the 19th century. And all of this kind of iconography was very much wed to the idea that these enslaved people were happy being enslaved. You know, I mean, literally, there's this ad here from the 1950s talking about how Aunt Jemima makes another couple happy. This kind of rhetoric is all the way, goes all the way back to the period of slavery during the 19th century when plantation, you know, uh, homes and plantation owners started to push back against abolitionist literature by trying to defend the institution of slavery by saying that their, you know, enslaved folks were just like family. It was aunt so-and-so, it was, it was uncle so-and-so. And these people love their position um, um, in these kitchens. And it's, it's very much tethered to the ways in which people think about enslaved cooks even till today. Part of the myths around these, these um, enslaved cooks as well is that one, they were happy, they were loyal, they were illiterate, right? And you see this very sort of um, broken English sort of um, quote here from, from Rastus, the, queen, the cream of wheat, <coughs> excuse me, um, guy here on this ad. And there's a lot of sort of you know, um, rhetoric around these enslaved people and even sort of ideas now that enslaved people did not know how to read or write. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, there were also this sort of myths that they were there to please the white folks, as you see in this Aunt Jemima, <clears throat> excuse me, ad in the left corner. And that um, one of the most pr uh, prevailing myths is that the people working in the house the cooks, the, you know, the, the maids, et cetera, who were enslaved were somehow very much culturally disconnected from their African roots and the larger enslaved community, those of which would work in the field. And so I push back against every single one of these things. Um, and I, I do this with actual archival, uh, you know, resources, archaeology, oral history, et cetera. What's I think incredibly fascinating about this is that while you have these images like this, that are so prevalent in these plantation museums, they sit alongside images of people like Aunt Jemima. So there's this contradiction that we see in American history, where on one hand, we want to pretend like it was the white lady of the house, the Mrs. Lees, you know, were cooking all the food. On the other hand, it's very obvious that there's an acknowledgement that these enslaved women and men were the ones actually cooking the food because we see them in the actual material culture. So it's a funny, weird American contradiction of which there are many. So let's uh, go straight to Stratford Hall. This is where I work. Um, this is a 1738 Georgian manor house built by enslaved African laborers in 1738. It was the home of the Lees of Virginia. And it was also home to a man named Caesar, who was in so many ways, one of the most well-known chefs long before James Hemings, long before Chef Hercules. And he was working here at Stratford in the 1770s. And he was one of three people in Virginia that were making chocolate during the colonial era, which is I think incredibly significant because he was also an enslaved man here in the colony. So the focus of this work is 18th and 19th century. I didn't want to leave the 18th century behind because of a lot of the resources. And I also felt the need to sort of take my work up into the 19th century and then sort of talk about the legacy of these kinds of spaces. So for a minute here, I wanna talk about race and the built environment. So I wanna talk for a little bit about the ways in which you can see um, the role of the enslaved cooks, how conditions were based on the ways in which these homes were physically built. I'm talking about the larger plantation homes here, not the small sort of middling farmhouses that you see in places um, throughout places like South Carolina, Virginia. I'm talking about the really large plantations that had a designated chef plus a chef staff. 
So one of the things that a lot of people hear when they go to these <clears throat> excuse me, plantation museums, any public history space that deals with this kind of history. Um, people are told that the, the kitchens were moved outside and you see right here on the right here is the kitchen and over here is a workhouse and this is the main house. There was a warming kitchen, however, right inside of there. So this idea that these kitchens were moved outside, which is a prevalent way, uh, a prevalent sort of tale told at these sites, comes from this quote right here from 1705. And it states, all their drudgeries of cookery, washing, dairies, etc., are performed in offices detached from their dwelling houses, which by this means are kept more cool and sweet. Okay, that's fine, right? We got this really fantastic quote from the 1700s, early 1705. And it's something that people really held on to, because it's a lot easier to say that somehow it might be a fire hazard, right? Or that the smell of that roasting duck might have been sort of too funky for the people living in the big house, when in reality, there's an abundance of evidence that shows that when there was a rise in enslaved Africans being shipped and captured and shipped over to the colonies, and a decline in white indentured labor, you start to see the physical sort of uh, foundations of these homes shift. And you see these kitchens being built outside to start designating separate spaces for enslaved people based on the status and sort of that racial demographic that was happening. So you have an influx of white ladies, so you have these houses, these large plantation homes are starting to really become part of the American architectural fabric. And we see a response to the arrival of these West um, African men and women, mostly men during this period, coming and cooking in these kitchens. And so the separation of space very much affected the ways in which these enslaved cooks had to deal. Another thing that you see in the built environment that is incredibly fascinating. And so I'm starting here, by the way, I'm starting big in the built environment. We're gonna get all the way down to the daily life um, towards the end of the talk. So one of the other things that you see in the built environment that I find so absolutely fascinating is that there were two moments in American history where things really shifted. The first was that moment when those kitchens, those summer kitchens, if you will, started being built outside. And the second is this uh, phenomenon of this, um, of either these underground passageways that you see here or dumb waiters being, you know, sort of established. These were were starting to become very popular, both being built underground, um, if you're talking about an all-weather passageway like you see here at Monticello, or the addition of dumbwaiters and homes became really popular because it allowed for a flexing of space. And so a dumbwaiter, for example, um, one of the things I like to bring up is there were conversations around the Revolutionary War, conversations about, you know, give me liberty or give me death, talking about about Patrick Henry's famous quote, talking about the institution of slavery, whether or not it was something that was going to continue, right, with the new America and with these conversations and with the slave revolts that were happening all over the diaspora, you start to see shifts happening with the furniture. You start to see dumbwaiters literally taking the place Think about that word, dumb waiter, as an enslaved person in these dining rooms when these conversations were happening. So if you were to have, if you were, say, Mon you know, at Monticello, if you were at the um, Stratford Hall and you were going to have some political conversations, you would then request to have the enslaved waiters not stand at your beck and call, but instead have a dumb waiter to put the food on so there'd be no risk of that information leaking out. And you also see the these underground passageways start to form that literally masked the flow of enslaved people to and from the kitchen. Um, one of the things that I find really fascinating about this, again, is that they started they really started to pop up in the architectural sort of, um, you know, uh, developments during the 1770s all the way up into the early 1800s. And they really got popular, one, around the Revolutionary War period, and then again at the closing of the transatlantic slave trade around 1808. And one of the things that I find particularly interesting is that there's a, a, a big sort of pushback on this saying, okay, but it was this classic architecture, it was Palladian, you know, that's what it was. That might be very much true. And I, I do believe that that was part of the the style of these of these different passageways and you see these sort of trellises but when you literally dig a passageway out from underneath 
you know, the ground in between the kitchen and the dining room, there's nothing architecturally stunning about that at all. And this is where I talk about this other thing from Berkeley Plantation. The sign is now gone. This is called the Whistling Walk Underground Passage. This is one of the things that would be really sort of focused on at the end of this tour. And they would talk about how the enslaved cooks or waiters would have to whistle as they walked, as they went from the kitchen into the um, into the dining room. And they say that it was because they didn't want them tasting the food when they were, you know, when they were walking through the passageway. And that's a completely, you know, twisted idea of what was actually happening. If there was a whistling walk, it was probably to make sure the people inside of the house knew that the enslaved people were coming, so they would stop talking about these kinds of things. And this sign right here is very much um, a sort of uh, stylistically sort of from the early like 40s and 50s, right when Jim Crow was very much a hold in places like Virginia and where this sort of narrative needed to be rewritten. So again, there's really fascinating things about the built environment that speak to these men and women's experiences in these kitchens. So why is all this this really important? So let's talk about something that I know, you know, is near and dear to South Carolinians, and I know is absolutely near and dear to most Southerners, Virginia's included, um, but the idea of Southern hospitality. So Southern hospitality is central to the ways in which we continue, right? I'm not even a Southerner, but I'm starting to become one sort of by, I don't know, I guess I've been in the South now collectively for almost 20 years, and I do have roots in the South, so I do feel somewhat connected to this idea, but no one talks about Northern hospitality. No one says anything about Western hospitality, right? So it's really fascinating when you think about the ways in which Southern hospitality is then correlated with the sort of uh, predominance of these enslaved laborers, both cooking the food and serving the food in a very sort of pic picturesque sort of scene, as you see here on the left. Now, these pineapples are very, very symbolic of hospitality because during the colonial era, these were some of the most rare things that you could ever imagine. So these symbolize hospitality because if you were one connected enough to get a fresh pineapple right off of a ship that came from the tropics, you were very, very well connected, probably very wealthy. And if you think about that as well, you know, those ships took a long time to get up the coast. So if you were at the Lee Plantation at Stratford Hall and you ended up with this, you know, sort of rare fruit and it hadn't gone bad on the trip, you would then have the ultimate sort of offering of hospitality and cut up this pineapple as a, as a giving to your guests. Um, the other thing, in addition to pineapples, that was considered very, very exotic where it was celery. And I don't think celery looks as nice on bookends or in architecture. So somehow that didn't make the cut. Um, but they actually had celery glasses that were literally made to hold celery because celery was another one of those rare exotic food items that was brought to um, the colonies and you know in seeds and then grown and then displayed on a table. But the importance of this is that Southern hospitality is synonymous with the South. It is something that Southerners pride themselves on. And I want to take a minute to sort of look back at the roots of that and how Southerners were able to really be able to have that hospitality, um, which was absolutely built on the backs of the enslaved laborers working in those kitchens. So if you traveled during this period, you would be in a carriage, you know, for days, if not weeks, say you're the Carters and you're coming up from Shirley Plantation to go visit the Lees in Westmoreland County. You're gonna be on that carriage for days, maybe even a week. And you get there and then, you know, basically a bell system was set up, you know, the bells would be rung and all the enslaved laborers would have to then literally be at the beck and call of every single free person that walked into that house. And one of the main things that these elite Southerners prided themselves on were these feasts. And I think food is so synonymous with the ways in which I think any human, right, likes to sort of show affection or welcome somebody into their home. And so if you think about the centrality and the importance of food and the ways in which, you know, dining was really in so many ways a kind of conspicuous consumption for a lot of these colonial elites, the enslaved cooks, their labor and their skill was at the center of all of that. They would not have had the ability to have a three to four course meal with up to six to seven, eight dishes per course if they didn't have enslaved chefs doing that labor and enslaved 
waiters and waitresses, you know, waiting on the on the people there, bringing the food up and making sure that the, the people that were visiting had this most amazing experience. This was so important to these elite early Americans. So something else that I want to talk about that's often forgotten, you know, enslaved cooks, they absolutely cooked the food that we just saw, you know, the, the roasted lamb and the pies and the jellies and all of those important things. But enslaved labor also went into making everything from, <clears throat> excuse me, rum, which is a West African recipe that was born in Barbados during the 17th century, which was then shipped up to the colonies and one of, was one of the most sort of, you know, uh, most important, um, you know, sort of uh, trade goods of the Atlantic world. They were making things like wine and beer. There were enslaved brewers throughout the colonies as well. Everything in this picture, this image here of when these men are getting together and they're talking about politics and the new nation and the ways in which this, you know, our, our collective people will create what became America. These conversations were happening literally by consuming the literal and figurative fruits of enslaved labor. The tobacco that they're smoking was grown by enslaved laborers, dried, shipped by enslaved laborers. So you, you think about the ways in which libations, the ways in which smoking and eating was so central to every important conversation during this period, you realize the real essential need of these enslaved chefs who literally supplied these very important early Americans with all the sustenance that they needed through these kinds of offerings. So I wanna talk a little bit here. This is Dontavious Williams. And I do want to take a second. He is a South Carolinian himself. He is a historical interpreter. He is a chef. He is a phenomenal storyteller. And I met Dontavious, goodness, I want to say about six, seven years ago. And we have become quick and fast friends. This is him at Stratford Hall. Um, he and I do a lot of work with our team um, to help tell the story of Caesar, who I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, who was the enslaved chef at Stratford. And this is him literally working in our kitchen. Um, and I think he's making peanut stew here, which is one of the very sort of famous Virginia stews, which is actually a West African dish. But I wanna talk for a minute about what it was like to actually have to work into, in one of these kitchens. So I want to, to take you into this space in particular and think about the kitchens that you've been in, um, especially ones like Stratford or other plantation houses, and think about the work that it would take to put on a meal like I showed you here a moment ago. So the hearth there at Stratford is about six foot, maybe one high, and it's gigantic. What they would do is they would put little fires all over the bottom of the hearth, which acted like their stovetop. The Lees were one of the most wealthy families in the colony, and they entertained a lot, as did most of these larger plantations. And so everything from the hours, these enslaved chefs had to work 24 hours a day. They slept in the kitchen. They had to cook things sometimes that took days to make. Things like head cheese is something that would take up to three days to cook and preserve. Everything from the oyster stews that they would have to cook to the jellies to the desserts. And all of this had to be done with precision because they were enslaved and the fear of being abused or sold away or punished was always on the table. And so the, the sort of delicacy at which these enslaved cooks had to navigate this space is something absolutely worth noting. So the hours were long, the fire burned hot, enslaved chefs would sometimes have to wet their apron down to keep it from catching on fire. And if anyone has ever been in the South, which I think probably everybody on the Zoom has been in the South during the summertime, you can imagine then walking into a kitchen with a hearth burning with a fire and how incredibly hot it must have been. So a lot of these enslaved chefs would have to sleep outside during the summertime. They would die from burns more than any other illness or sickness because you can imagine the ways in which, you know, you're working on that fire, it's open flame, and you're literally in the fire sometimes, you know, turning pots of things and moving coals, etc. One of the things that I learned through a significant amount of, of oral history is that a lot of the descendants of these enslaved chefs told me that they learned from their, you know, their grandmother's grandmother, grandmother, all the way up, that the ways in which they would test a bread oven, 
is that these enslaved chefs would have to put their arm in it. And if their arm burned a little bit, the oven was ready for the bread. So if you think about making bread every day for 30, 40 years, that's a lot of burns and a lot of, you know, literal toll on your body. So the rebel system set up as well. So anybody that visited, any free white person that came to visit um, would be served anything during any time of the day. You show up at three in the morning and you're going to get a hot ham biscuit because that is the way Southerners like to be hospitable. And all of this labor fell onto the hands and backs of these enslaved chefs. Let's talk about food here for a minute because I know some of you got on here because you wanted to hear about the food and I totally get that because food is everything. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the ways in which these West African recipes that came over in the minds of these enslaved chefs were passed down through generations, literally became part of American cuisine. So I don't think anybody would argue that gumbo is a very Southern thing. And I would say a lot of Americans would claim that as part of American cuisine. And there is no difference between gumbo in West Africa, which is literally another name for okra, um, and what was then made in the colonies. You see different ingredients being put in. These one pot meals were essential as a survival technique for these enslaved individuals. Because if you were in the field, for example, and you were given just your ration once a week, say if you're in Virginia, you might get a little bit of cornmeal, a little bit of fat back, and then you would have to then garden on the side to supplement that. You would have to set up traps to catch, you know, different animals to put into these one pots. And that one pot then would boil all day and cook down with a you know, collective group of, of donations from the, the slave quarter community and dishes like gumbo, which were which was very much a staple in parts of West Africa were then recreated both out of want, but also out of necessity because of the ways in which this, the institution of slavery was set up in the colonies. But things like gumbo transferred over seamlessly. Um, oyster stew is something that you find evidence of, of course, in some European cuisines, but there's colonial and pre-colonial era recipes for oyster stew coming out of places like Senegambia, today, present day Senegal and Gambia. And you have peanut stew, which literally, if, if there's any Virginians on here, you know that peanut soup is one of those Virginia things, right? And I know about 25, 30 years ago, you couldn't go into any little corner store or little restaurant and not see it on the menu. It has long since sort of faded out. But Virginia um, prides itself on its peanut soup. And that is absolutely without question a West African recipe things like okra. Um, you also, you know, okra stew is also West African. Jambalaya, which is another sort of Southern pride dish, right? A rice dish with all different things in there. You got seafood, you got sausage. That is a descendant of what's called jollof rice, which is a, a variant of a rice dish that's cooked throughout parts of West Africa still to this day. So you have this really beautiful sort of transfer of West African dishes that made their way the recipes in the minds of the enslaved on throughout the Middle Passage made it onto the slave quarters and then into the big house kitchen, which then ended up on these dining room tables of some of the most important, you know, people in American history, people like Thomas Jefferson, people, um, you know, George Washington was eating things like this. And these were West African recipes. One of the things that I found most fascinating in my research is that we see these recipes starting to be written into these cookbooks by the white mistress of the house, because I guarantee they tasted them and then made sure that these recipes were kept to be able to pass down through generations. So this right here is an image. I want to talk a little bit more about sort of the kitchen as a space um, where everyone came together. So I'm an archaeologist. And one of the things that I did um, for the research for this book is I looked at the architectural space of these, these kitchens, but also through, <clears throat> excuse me, archaeological collections of, you know, kitchens that had fallen down you know, centuries ago or decades ago and that have been excavated. And I found artifacts that really kind of looked like these kitchens were a space where a lot of activity was happening even outside of just regular cooking. Um, I also found significant numbers of letters talking about how the enslaved community, um, members of the enslaved community from the field quarters would sometimes come up and have weddings in the kitchen in the big house. So you have this intersection of the, the white family, as you see in this image right here, and this is from 
1838 at White Sulphur Springs, Virginia. It was a, a larger sort of resort space. So this kitchen is significantly larger than you would normally see. But what you see in here is some type of wedding sort of thing happening. You see maybe the you know, the planter, whoever there, sort of looking over at what's happening. And what's really fascinating about this is I found oral history, slave narratives that talked about these kitchen spaces being very dynamic. And if you think about it, if the enslaved chefs had to cook 24 seven, had to stay up late to make sure things were cooking correctly, people would then come and keep them company and provide some kind of social engagement in this space to help those enslaved cooks stay up all night. It was also a space in which the white family, right, and the enslaved folks in the quarter would then come together, kind of like a crossroads, if you will, of different cultures and statuses on a plantation. And this brings me to some more of the archaeological stuff that I mentioned a moment ago, and really sort of thinking about one of those myths that I talked about in the very beginning is that these people working in the house, these enslaved chefs, were somehow disconnected from not just the folks that lived in the quarter, but their West African culture, right? The idea of an Uncle Tom is very much sort of riddled with this idea of someone who's a sellout, you know, who just is not faithful to their, you know, their brothers and sisters, and they're more sort of loyal to the white family. And I really push back against this, that idea in my work, because these enslaved chefs were subversive. They were working in a white landscape, but they were absolutely still connected to everything that they brought with them into that space. They were just able to act um, as a spy, almost, if you will, or in a space um, and work that space the way that they needed to for certain ways. And one of the ways in which these enslaved uh, chefs did this is there's incredible evidence found in the mid-Atlantic region, all the way from, you know, places in Maryland, all the way down to North Carolina, where you see evidence of, of hoodoo being practiced. Hoodoo is a West African conjuring tradition. Um, it is also very much in line with the Congo Cosmogram. Um, the crossroads is something that is universally seen throughout the African diaspora as a symbol of, of the crossroads between the living and the dead, birth and, and death. And the idea that when you make an X on an object, which we found again archaeologically throughout the African diaspora, if you make an if they made an X on an object, they were conjuring spirits to come in through that object and protect those around them. One of the things that we found in some of these kitchens is an abundance of of objects that have X's on them. Also, what's called a cache, C A, excuse me, C H E which would be a bundle of objects that would be made up of everything from broken ceramics to um, shells that indicate the passing through water to the ancestral world to crystals that would also help conjure the ancestors bundled up and placed in the north, <coughs> excuse me, east or northwest quadrant of these kitchen hearths. So there is evidence of West African religion being practiced in these kitchens which were very much a part of the white landscape. So for me, that really sort of pushes back against the idea that these, that these men and women, you know, once they got into the big house, they forgot about who they were. They absolutely did not. And my argument is that they probably helped a lot of people um, in the quarters as well, if they were doing that kind of root work to be able to give them objects and faith to then persevere enslavement. One of the things that um, it is, it is, uh, inarguable that these men and women working in these kitchens had the power to poison and it terrified uh, the white families. One of the things that I, I particularly loved researching was the cases in which these, these men and women were accused of poisoning and then got off. Um, I think the more depressing stories are the ones that were probably either falsely accused and still executed um, or executed either way because they were literally fighting to be free. No different, right, than what, what the patriots did to try to sort of free themselves and gain their freedom. These men and women were literally enslaved and bound and, and bond to these you know, they're enslavers. And the only way that they could see to get out sometimes was through poisoning. Um, one of the most fascinating things about all of this 
is that the the threat of poison really loomed, and you can read these these letters, um, these you know correspondence back and forth from these plantation mistresses, sort of getting really nervous about being poisoned. And these moments happened after major slave revolts, where all of a sudden they 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 realize that maybe right their enslaved cook wasn't so happy after all. So especially you see this after Nat Turner's revolt. You know, I don't think enslaved cooks cook too much for a few weeks after that revolt, after that revolution, because people were so afraid to eat the food because they thought that there was a massive plot, which there kind of was, um, to overturn the institution of slavery. So you have these really sort of brief moments where these enslaved cooks yielded a little bit of power um, within their oppression. And it's really important to think about the ways in which also a lot of these men and women had knowledge of, of herbal medicines, right? So the back of all the cookbooks that you would see um, and during this period, you see all these handwritten notes for medicine. The only difference between medicine is, and poison is dosage, right? You take two Tylenol, you feel good. You eat a whole bottle, you're in the emergency room. So these enslaved chefs had the ability, if nothing else, to scare and frighten those who enslaved them. And with that negotiation, they were able to sometimes, um, you know, put things off or, or take breaks in ways that you couldn't if you were an enslaved person in a different part of the plantation. So I like to sort of wrap this up um, right here with these two images that I love dearly. Um, and I want to start out by just talking for a moment about why I picked this image here on the left for the cover of my book. So, you know, enslaved women were not written um, down in history as much as enslaved men. You have people, we know about James Hemings, we know about Chef Hercules, right? Thomas Jefferson's enslaved chef and George Washington's enslaved chef. We do not know about the tens of thousands of highly skilled enslaved women who worked in these, in these kitchens. None of them became celebrities, if you will, um, the same way that those two very important men did. And I wanted to have this woman in particular on my cover because her name was not recorded, but her story was. So this image is from um, an 1855 drawing from David Hunter Strother, and he was a writer for Harper's New Monthly Magazine, and he was traveling through Virginia, and he took an overnight trip, a stop, in Amherst County, just north of Lynchburg, in between Lynchburg and Charlottesville, and he spent the night, and he saw the cook at this at this this home that he stayed in and he just was struck by one how intelligent she was how she was the master of the house as he puts he said that her children had the first dips in all gravy and ate the breasts of fried chicken but he did not write her name down and so i really wanted to have a woman here who represents so many African-American women through time who have not been recognized as the cover of my book. And I end with this absolutely wonderful piece of artwork from 1972 by Betty Saar in Berkeley, California, called The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. And this right here is a wonderful sort of depiction of what I'm trying to do and what others that are doing this similar work are trying to do to give a new voice, a new story, a new lens to these men and women, and women in particular, who labored in these kitchens. They were not just victims of enslavement. They brought their skills, their passion, their love, and their, and their talent to these kitchens and literally helped create American cuisine. So history is not about forgetting. It's about remembering these people who labored in these kitchens and what they actually gave to us as a nation. And I'm gonna end my talk right there and stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. I am going to see about um, any questions. As, as we said before, if you have any, please write them in the chat. And let me see what we can get here. And if anyone ever wants to come visit Stratford, let me know. <laughs> I will comp your tickets. <laughs> I have said I have been there. It is a wonderful place, wonderful place to visit. This is Stratford's kitchen right here behind me. 
I'm kind of in it, sort of. And I know you all, a lot of you are in South Carolina. If you ever have a chance to see Dontavius Williams um, or his program called The Chronicles of Adam, please check him out. He is phenomenal. His storytelling is mind blowing. I mean, I just, you know, your heart will just, you know, explode. He's a wonderful, wonderful storyteller and historian. That's wonderful. That, that would be a, a beautiful series. Um, there is a question. Uh, do you have any idea on what, Lee, hang on, the, on what Lee Cook created the Robert E. Lee cake, which is lemon and orange? I do not know, but you know what? I'm going to write this down because that is a great question. So Robert E. Lee left when he was about three or four from Stratford. So um, I'm not sure who would have been cooking that cake, but I'm going to look into that. If you have any idea of where you've seen that or where you've heard of that, you can email me at kdeets at stratfordhall.org. That would be fantastic because I have not heard of that. And that I have, I have not heard of it either. So, uh, but it sounds good. We have, yeah, we have our Richard Henry Lee apple, apple butter recipe, which is phenomenal. Of course, Richard Henry Lee wasn't the one making it, but it was his favorite. So, oh, and it's wow. quite nice. Yeah. Um, someone was asking, you touched on a number of recipes, but um, th do any, are there any that hit you as being particularly labor intensive? <sighs> oh my goodness, a lot of them. I mean, there's anything baking, you know, when you have to bake in a Dutch oven on an open fire, it's, you know, that's, that takes a serious skill. And so any of the puddings would be really hard. And my goodness, Dontavius was at Stratford for Christmas tide and he was doing a duck a la orange and that thing took hours and, you know, duck gets overcooked like that. So, you know, I think any of those things, anyone that works on a hearth, I mean, gets chops from me. I worked in normal kitchens with wolf stoves and those ovens and those, that whole setup is really incredibly hard. One of the things that I think about is, um, is making a roux, like a cream, any kind of like oyster stew or any kind of cream sauce on the open hearth. It is so easy to break that and have it curdle. And so anything like that is incredibly hard. Yes, I can imagine. Um, another question is, what is your suggestion to restaurateurs and other food purveyors to shine a historic light on our food ways? Oh, great questions. You know, there's, it's actually really wonderful. So when I started working on this project, it was about 15 years ago. And no one was really talking about this stuff. You know, it's like within the last couple of years, we've got all these books out and the high in the home documentary and everyone's like, oh, this is amazing. And it's like, it's really nice having this kind of synergy right now. So I would say, you know, look to some of the amazing interpreters, you know, people like Don Tavius, people like Nicole Moore, Cheney McKnight, there are phenomenal African-American hearth books and interpreters that you could have come give a talk, you know, maybe have a tasting at your restaurant, you know, have a conversation, have a lecture like this at your restaurant and maybe serve some of the food, you know, a tasting menu where you, you're able to, you know, get some of these historic recipes and just do like a little sampling of them. But there's so many ways to pay honor to these enslaved cooks and, and the food that they brought to us. So it's a wonderful question. Yeah. And, and in many ways, we're, we're paying honor to them without saying who they are because we're, yeah. we're serving these up, at least to, I know in the South oh, yeah. we are for sure. People eat this all the time, <laughs> all exactly. this good stuff. <laughs> Um, another question asked, um, could you talk a little about the role of, roles of children in the kitchen? Absolutely. So Caesar, for instance, at Stratford Hall, um, his family lived with him in the kitchen. His son ended up being a postillion, which is one of the guys that, you know, ride, rode, what is that, like on the horse for the carriage, you know, very formal job. But the, the children of the cook would typically work in and around the house. And they would do everything from pick green beans to, you know, wash, wash the greens to, you know, pluck the chickens, you name it. So, you know, farm to table is a big thing right now. Everything was farm to table back then. So, you know, go get a chicken, go kill the chicken, go pull the, you know, pluck the chicken, get it ready. All of that kind of prep work would have been done by, by kids and they would e either have worked up and then become the chef one day or worked inside of the house or somewhere in that area. But the enslaved cooks were able to live with their immediate family in the kitchen 
which is something that I, I have not seen any evidence of um, for any other enslaved occupation on the plantation had that kind of pull. And it's because of those different things, the poisoning, the reliance on the food right. and all of that. Enslaved chefs were the second, if not, they were either the first or second most valued person on the plantation. When you look at those hard numbers, when you look at the, you know, um, the probates and the wills and those kinds of things. The butler was the only person that had a higher status and not always. Interesting. Um, another question said, uh, did many enslaved chefs go on to be restaurant owners or caterers? Yes, absolutely. So um, as my work ends right during the Civil War, you see this really amazing um, sort of, you know, the great migration started happening and even people like Chef Hercules who ended up running away, Washington chef, you know, he got away and I'm sure, you know, his life, you know, he figured out a way to sell his, you know, his skills after he emancipated himself. But there's incredible stories about these former chefs then moving to places like Chicago, Baltimore, et cetera, and opening up restaurants and becoming caterers. There was one uh, man named Emmanuel Jones who was the enslaved cook at Flower Dew Hunter Plantation, that one slide that I had with the archeology. span And he was the enslaved chef right during the Civil War. What he did is he stayed on after, after he was freed, but he didn't have to do the, the sharecropping thing. He actually just stayed on and cooked for his former enslaver, but then got paid to do it and saved up enough money to where then he left, you know, a few years later, he moved to Petersburg and set up shop over there and didn't have to get in that, the uh, sharecropping trap that so many of the people who worked in the field got stuck in afterwards. So yeah, that was one of the things that really allowed these people to leave was their skills in the kitchen. Right, and, and to plug for next week, um, our speaker next week is David Shields, who's written a book called The Culinarians. Um, and he's, he talks about some of those, those enslaved people who became chefs and caterers. Um, another question, Kelly, is, and I, I'm not sure, do you know the ratio between males and females in, in the kitchen? Yeah, so it's, I don't have an exact number. I do know during the, <clears throat> during the early 18th century, late, so, okay, the late 17th, early 18th century, it was mostly men. Um, that was also because there were mostly men coming in from West Africa into the colonies. Um, it was believed during that period that men withstained burns more and they were stronger and they were able to do that kind of work. As more women were being captured and enslaved and brought into the colonies, as families started to grow of enslaved people on plantations, those women started taking that, that position. And there's a lot of really fascinating ways of looking at that too, um, with sort of the relationships between the enslaved cooks, right, and the woman of the house and sort of fears of, of you know, sexual relationships and those kinds of things happening, sort of switching it from mostly men to then mostly women. But it's it's pretty much split. And it's, it's you know, even right at the end of the 19th century, or the beginning of the Civil War, rather, you've got a, a significant number of women still in those kitchens, but there's, it's, it's a nice split. But I was never able to get a perfect number. And I don't think we ever can, unfortunately, but it did go from mostly men to a nice, you know, sort of 50-50 mix towards the end there. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and one, Melinda wanted to know, is there a recipe from Stratford that's particularly well known? All I can think of is the Richard, it's not even well known as the Richard Henry Lee apple butter, which I right. think is like just apples and cinnamon. Um, I haven't found anything, you know, we don't have our, the cookbooks from Stratford. We have a cookbook from down the road from another plantation, which we can maybe think that, you know, might be similar, but the Lees were eating some of the most expensive foods you could ever imagine. I mean, they insisted on their Madeira coming from the island of Madeira and going down past the equator to make sure it got toasted enough with that heat to then be able to come to Virginia to sip it. So if it was fancy, they were eating it. I mean, they were out Jefferson Jeffersoning before Jefferson was, was doing it. So I can imagine what the things that they were eating, but I don't have any firm recipes from the 18th century. Okay. Um, this one resonates with me. I was also born in Virginia, and this, this person asked, uh, she's familiar with spoon bread, and people in South Carolina don't seem to know anything about it. Um, do you happen to know the origin of spoon bread? 
You know, I don't. Um, I don't I have no idea at all, but I know things like spoon bread and even, I mean, hoe cakes, you know, you're sitting there and I, George Washington apparently loved hoe cakes, but you're in the kitchen, you know, you've got like everything's going and you even see this now with professional chefs that they're catering, you know, you're making the main food, but then there's always like little things that you eat while you go, you know? So I, I don't know the history of it. If I had to guess, it was something that kind of came out of you know, something that you're doing on the side while you're trying to eat or feed the kids, you know, while you're cooking right. in those spaces. Well, it's, it's funny because it's almost like a souffle. Um, yeah, but, but really it, is, beautiful. it is something I do prepare because if you're Virginian, you have to do it. <laughs> I love it. Well, this has been wonderful, Dr. Dietz. We cannot thank, thank you. you enough for joining us. Um, and uh, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Uh, also wanted to mention that Dr. Dietz's book is available online at our gift shop at schistory.org. <laughs> so um, I'm sure many of you would look forward to having that. Uh, I do hope you'll join, join us next week when David Shields talk about the history of some signature dishes of uh, the Carolinas, some um, which have disappeared, like some that you heard tonight. So, so it'll be an interesting talk. Uh, and uh, as Scott said, if you're not already a member of the South Carolina Historical Society, I do hope you will consider becoming a member. Again, Dr. Dietz, this was a real treat. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much. And thank you all for zooming in. And please come visit at Stratford. Just email me and I'll roll the red carpet out. Wonderful. That, that would be a treat. Take care and see everyone soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.